Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AM Impact on Your Health. AM Impact on Your Health, where every day our goal is to have you learn at least one thing to help you live better and longer. AM Impact on Your Health is heard each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney. And I'm with you each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9. And impact on your health for each day you'll find current medical news, knowledgeable guests, fascinating health topics, and, of course, where we do encourage you to call in to join in. Folks, today is our launch of the Top Doc Summer. Now, if you've been following me at all, you know that um, all a few weeks ago I went and visited a... Uh, little town called Phoenix, Arizona, there was a wonderful and gala event there entitled the 20 Top Docs, Alternative Docs in the United States. Now, each one of these 20 doctors had an opportunity to present their message uh, to the audience, which was comprised of um, lay persons as well as professionals alike. And at the end, as they were coming off the stage, I was there waiting for them. And I said, look, you got to bring that same message to my listeners. Will you do it? And to the person, they all consented yes. So uh, we're starting off now today with Dr. Carl Robinson. He is a MD, medical doctor from Houston, Texas. We're going to be talking about, I thought, about aluminum, and we may end up really talking about it, but it turns out this gentleman is one of the most practiced and, uh, and adept homeopathists in the country. My goodness gracious, after reading his chapters in the book uh, put together uh, called The 20 Top Docs, we've got to at least start off there and we'll see where it takes us. Carl Robinson, Dr. Carl Robinson, our guest today. Now, in the course of our discussions with Dr. Robinson, you want to call and ask a question or make a comment, the number to do that, as you know by now, is to dial us up at 412-825-6262. That's 412-825-6262. Now, this month is just packed with guests. I really enjoy bringing them to you on Wednesday. Another top doc. We're trying to keep them on Mondays and Wednesdays. Top doc, Dr. Michael Margolis, a dentist, to discuss mercury toxicity. Uh, on Friday, um, of course, an excellent doctor, just not one of the 20 was in, in uh, Phoenix, his name is Dr. James Barber. We're going to be talking about cancer uh, and predisposition testing for it. There's now genomic testing out there. It's pretty sophisticated. If you worry about familial ties to pretty serious diseases, you'll want to pay attention on Friday. The next week, we come back with the top docs on Mondays and Wednesdays again. On Monday, it's Mark Stark, Dr. Mark Stark. Uh, he is from Phoenix, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, his newest book, Heart attacks, heart failure, and diabetes, prevention and treatment, and he treats it with thyroid hormone. Wow. Uh, I was all ears for that one. Next Wednesday, Dr. Lee Cowden, a uh, board-certified cardiologist, is going to be talking to us about cancer treatments. And then the uh, following week after that, Bruce Shelton, another homeopathy doctor, is going to be with us on the 23rd, and finally on the 25th, the bad boy. I say that because he's caused controversy wherever he goes, uh, a lot of fervor, uh, and usually has whipped up the medical, uh, the conventional medical doctors in his area, wherever he hangs a shingle. His name is Dr. David Steenbach, and uh, he'll be talking about stem cells. That's how this month is going to be um, rounded up. On the 27th, we're going to bring a new product line to you. Uh, if you have concerns with type 2 diabetes, if you have concerns about your ability to properly metabolize food, you want to learn about a company called Brescia. And I'll be launching that company with us on the 27th. If we hadn't done enough already for the months of June, 
we're going to cap it off with that. Now, as I flip the page, just looking into the month of July, uh, Nicholas Myers, another top doc, is going to be with us on the 14th of July. This schedule will be much more filled out between now and then, and I'll let you know. I programs, uh, we're one week to go. We start our June eye program. For those of you that may be afflicted with eye disorders, especially macular degeneration, um, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, don't forget the three-day treatment program, the Chondrock program uh, we offer it here. It'll be started on Monday, excuse me, Tuesday of next week. It's a three-day program, 17, 18, and 19. This is just about it. If you don't make a move today, you'll have to be pushed to some other month. Uh, just got enough time to get the records in and everything squared away for a pretty nice encounter here in my office. I'll let you know all about it as time rolls on. Very good, very good. Uh, what, else, what else? We want to uh, make certain that you are um, aware of the um, uh, ozone situation here. We've got uh, a uh, pretty much a, a string of patients now just literally flooding us with interest about can ozone help them. Uh, the Ozone Express is, is in, alive and in full battle regalia. We are um, really seeing some amazing, amazing turnarounds. Um, follow with me by going to the shows done with Dr. Frank Schallenberger. Uh, he'll bring you up to speed really fast. There are three shows we did with Frank. So go to my website at djcmd.com. On the opening page, click on, I, on the uh, icon marked archives. And then you're taken to YouTube. All of my radio shows since 19, excuse me, 2003 are up there. That's quite a few shows. So as to spare you the need for scrolling, hit the search engine and type in Courtney slash Schallenberger slash Ozone. And the three radio shows will come up. Listen to those shows. I think... In short order, you'll be brought to speed and appreciate the intrigue that goes along with those on this very safe substance that seem to be turning everything around. And I plan on bringing, uh, I got a lot of testimonials building up, I plan on bring one, bringing them on Fridays to allow you to hear their story as they lived it and as they are getting their particular medical situations turned around. Okay, let's do this. Going to take a short break. Uh, and as we do, we hope to connect with Dr. Carl Robinson, our guest today, the uh, renowned homeopathist. We're going to be talking about homeopathy. We looked in that chapter of the book last night. This gentleman is a pedigree. We're going to learn from him what we haven't learned anyplace else, I'm going to guess. And uh, be right back in a moment with Dr. Carl. Best to manage your health. Okay, we got him. Give me a few seconds. Okay. Another expert has yet another. Carl. Hi, Dennis. Good morning to you, Carl. Good morning to you. Hey, um, I got into the chapter last night, and I'm going, my goodness gracious, all this homeopathy stuff. That's your, that's your real contribution. We will have to delve into that front and center. You don't mind, do you? Which, which chapter are you talking about? The one you wrote in the book, 20 Top Docs. Oh. I don't even remember what I wrote about that. Um, well, it was an interview you do with that. It was an interview you do with that on homeopathy. Yeah, I know, but I thought we were to talk about aluminum today. We will talk about aluminum. You've got to start us off with homeopathy. That's where you do, that's where you do all your work from. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course I can talk about homeopathy. Okay, we'll kick it off with homeopathy. About halfway, we'll switch into aluminum. Fair enough? Okay, whatever you wish. I'm oh, I got, I got to hear your message on homeopathy. On aluminum, so I'm more up to speed on that. Go ahead. Yeah, whatever. Okay, well, I'm just going to get to your background and a couple of simple questions on homeopathy, and then I'll switch gears. I, I would appreciate uh, some plug-in from my new book, uh, Small... Small doses, big results. I see you here on the website, and we will take care of it front and center right as soon as they hand it to us. Okay, Carl? 
be ready to give out that information. I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Thanks. All right. Rest easy. We've got about another 30 seconds. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to AM Impact on the Health. Heard on KHB 620 each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney with you today on a Monday morning version of the show and really a launch, a launch of numerous shows which will be coming up, and I swear it's going to take me all summer to do it, but this spills off of a wonderful occasion uh, that occurred in Phoenix, Arizona a few weeks ago where some pretty intelligent doctors got together and they were looked at and awarded as the 20 top doctors, alternative doctors, in America. Now, after they were presenting their uh, particular topics, I was up there pestering them, asking them, would you mind, please, to come aboard to my radio show. My listeners would love to hear the strong messages that each of you doctors have brought to our attention here. To the person, they all said, I'd sure like to do that, and somebody has to get that started. Well, it starts today with a gentleman, a physician, a medical doctor from Houston, Texas, who's got a pretty storied career when it comes to a number of things, one in the realm of homeopathy. Uh, during his presentation there, we talked about aluminum, so we're going to get in both today. We want to say good morning and welcome aboard to our first Top Doc show. Dr. Carl Robinson, good morning, Carl. Thanks for allowing me to invade your morning today. Good morning to you, Dr. Courtney. And uh, how can I help you and your listeners? Oh, my goodness gracious. You have opened the can of worms. You're going to be able to help us considerably, Doctor. Your, um, your background is one very much entrenched in a, a fascinating topic, and I don't think we've really had the opportunity to have such an expert today with you as we've ever seen available to me in the past, and I'm hoping that we can spend just a little bit of time on uh, homeopathy before we get to the crux of the issue today, which was aluminum toxicity, the actual presentation you made to the group in Phoenix. But I look at your story, and, uh, and in most cases in alternative medicine, there, there's a similar pattern, uh, an epiphany for some reason occurs. And our medical training gets called into question, and we just move away from it, and we embrace some other approach. Now, I like your story because um, I could really empathize where where you were going to medical school and, and the kind of influence that may have had on the choices you made. But could you give my listeners a good background on, on yourself in terms of how it is that you arrive in the form of practice, medical practice today? Uh, as time had moved on since your early medical training. Take it away. Sure. Um, well, I was uh, doing my residency in Harlem Hospital in New York City many years ago and uh, became progressively more and more disillusioned with what I saw. And, of course, what I saw was a kind of uh, revolving door thing with extremely sick patients being admitted, worked up, treated, discharged, and then they often came back three or four weeks later even sicker. And the same thing would go on and on, and I found an appalling disinterest, total disinterest in diet, and uh, a huge interest in, of course, invasive techniques of all sorts. So it didn't take very long for me to become quite disillusioned with uh, modern medicine, especially in the field of chronic disease. I don't have such strong opinions against modern medicine and infectious disease where antibiotics have often proved useful, although I must say uh, it's not very much fun to see how these children with otitis media ear, ear infections during the winter have one infection treated with an antibiotic and then a month later they get another one and then a third and a fourth all treated with antibiotics so that it calls into question even antibiotics. But 
back to my story, I started looking around and within some months I found homeopathy. And the thing <clears throat> that drew me to homeopathy was that it's entirely safe. There are no adverse effects like there are with drugs. And it can be extremely effective when used by somebody who knows what they're doing. And basically, homeopathy is the utilization of extremely small doses coming from either plants or minerals or animal products. And they're prepared by diluting these products. For example, you take a plant, immerse it in alcohol for six weeks, drain it off, and you're left with what's known as a tincture. And then we begin to dilute that tincture, uh, one to ten, one drop of the tincture plant, plus nine drops of water, then it's shaken, then that, that uh, solution is diluted again, one to ten, and so on. Each time it's shaken, either by machine or by slamming the vial held in your hand against a heavy book, and so very quickly, our medicines become so dilute that there's not even any molecules left by calculation. So what is left? Well, our detractors say nothing's there, and it's all placebo. It's all imaginary. But it apparently affects the way the molecules, the water molecules, uh, are attached and, uh, to each other. At any rate, these medicines have some sort of subtle energy which, when, when, uh, when applied correctly, have uh, extraordinary effects on people. Now, how do we know how homeopathic medicines work? Well, they're given to healthy people until these healthy people begin to show symptoms. And these symptoms are cataloged. They're not noted down and uh, recorded. So when we treat, when we uh, prove these, these, these medicines on healthy people, hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of symptoms occur with a great kind of a, a red thread running through them, which is the essence of the medicine. So this immediately is different from allopathic or conventional medicine where all the drugs are, are um, tried out first on animals where they no longer kill animals, they back off from there. And homeopathic medicines, as I said, are proved or investigated on healthy people in these very, very small doses. So when a patient c comes in, we are asking them what their problem is, and they begin to talk, and we make notes, and then we ask them questions. And after a while, we have a kind of portrait of their disease. And then we try to match their symptom, their portrait, with a known portrait of the homeopathic medicine and what it, what, it, what, it, what it causes in healthy people. When we get a good match, we give that medicine and the person gets better. That's what homeo means. Homeo means the same as. And pathy comes from uh, the same word that means that we use a pathology or illness. So we're using the same medicine that causes symptoms to take them away. That's what homeo and pathy means, homeopathy then. Take now, the same medicine that causes symptoms to take the symptoms away. Is that the quote? That's the idea. Now, in regular medicine, conventional medicine, they have a, a kind of very weak, weakened idea of that. In they do allergy desensitization, where they give, uh, a, say, a, a pollen or something you're allergic to. They take a very small dose, but it's still measurable. I mean, it's a small dose, but there are chemicals in it. And they inject it into the skin, and the body builds antibodies to it. And then they eventually uh, become less sensitive to that allergen. So that's that's a kind of weak cousin to homeopathy. Yeah, well, you're but, given the same 
you're given the very same um, substance in energetic form to get a therapeutic result. And that's pretty much the, the entire ball game when it comes to homeopathy. Did I hear that right, Doc? Well, it's not really. Well, I, I call it the weak cousin because they're they're doing um, one allergen, you know, one one pollen at a time or one food at a time. Uh, and what we do when we when we're uh, treating people, we find out that there are many many mental and emotional symptoms as well as many many physical symptoms. So whenever you take a case history of virtually anyone, you're going to find out that in addition to their physical symptoms, they have certain mental characteristics, many of which they don't want, like anxiety or depression or fear, so on. So we take those into account also. Now, the allergy, you know, the, the allergy desensitization, people don't do that at all. They're strictly on the physical level. So we are in effect, treating the whole person, the mind, the mind intellectually, the mind emotionally, as well as the body and all aspects of the body. So we, and when I say all aspects, we even ask people if they're sensitive to heat or cold, what foods they particularly crave or dislike or foods they don't deal with well, uh, the weather, on and on. So when we get this match, we give the medicine. And when we have the correct medicine, people get better. Now, the, um, the fascinating thing you just mentioned a moment ago uh, is, is such a novel concept. I'm going to ask you to come back to it because when you pick a remedy, you're picking that remedy not on a one-to-one -one like if they had, um, like they had a headache, uh, but you're taking in the mind-body-spirit connection and that three different complaints, or maybe even more, Gets okay. matched up with a remedy. Right? I'm hearing that right. Yeah, you're, you're 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 catching it. Now let me give you an example. I'll make it a hypothetical, but it's an extremely common one. Let's say a woman comes in with migraines, and she's had them. First, my first question is, I ask you to, to describe the migraines, and each migraine's a little different. I mean, there's many similarities, but they're slightly, somewhat different. Sometimes they're on one side of the head, sometimes on the other. Uh, at any rate, I say, when did they begin? And she says, well, she gives me a number. They began seven years ago, we'll say. And then my question is, well, what was going on in your life about seven or eight years ago? And then possibly, actually quite commonly, I've seen it, she begins to weep. Mm. And she explains that she lost say, a son in Iraq or Afghanistan or in an automobile accident, but a grief of some sort. Now, within weeks or a month or two, she develops these migraines. She didn't have them before. And I see now that she's got two complaints. Her grief is unresolved, clearly, or she wouldn't be weeping. And we know she's got the migraines. Now, I've got two salient symptoms here, which we call ailments from grief plus headaches. Now I ask a little bit more about the headaches and I find that she can only tolerate 15 minutes in the sun before she gets a headache. So now I know that her headaches are very sensitive to the sun. I mean very sensitive, 10 to 15 minutes. That's not normal. And then I go into her likes and dislikes about uh, foods, for example, and I found that, find that she craves salt. And now I'm thinking of a medicine, and I ask her about her face. How is your face? Is it oily or dry or average? She says, well, it's quite oily. So now I have a very good picture of natrum muriaticum, which is Latin for salt, sodium chloride. And prepared homeopathically, uh, it's quite potent for both grief and headaches especially headaches which are sensitive to the sun and in people that crave salt. So I give her a dose, I see her a month later, and she's much better. Now, what do I mean by better? There's three factors. The headaches must be less frequent, and they must be less intense, and they must last for a shorter time. And indeed, I find all that 
Uh, they're now much, much less intense. And she's only had one or two before she was having three or four a week. And I find, very mysteriously, that her craving for salt is gone. Now, at the same time, she seems much happier and brighter, and there seems to be virtually no traces of the, the grief. So here we have a, of a, have a good example of how we're treating the mind and the body uh, all in one fell swoop. Does that give you an idea? That's such a powerful idea, completely the antithesis of the conventional model where you mentioned, I counted four different symptoms. You and I both know we were taught to write four different prescriptions, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. And you say that one remedy, by the way, salt water, diluted salt water at that, has the capability to provoke those kinds of symptoms and consequently in low doses can correct them. That is a fascinating. I've never had homeopathy explained that way before. I'm, I'm, I'm well, it, gets, it gets it gets more it gets more sophisticated now. This person who needs salt, natrium muriaticum, is sensitive to the heat, doesn't like the heat. But another person with migraines might be cold and sensitive to the cold and doesn't like it. And that would send us toward another medicine called Ignatia, I G N A T I A. Uh, both Ignatia people and Natrium Uriaticum people, when they are in grief, when they're upset, when they're grieving, when they're sad, they reject consolation. They don't want anyone to be sweet to them. Okay, this is quite interesting. So the distinguishing point between Ignatia and Natrium Uriaticum is that one is sensitive to the, to the heat, Natrium Uriaticum, the other one sensitive to the cold. Also, when People who need Ignatia cry, they tend to sob. And it's kind of a... <laughs> mm. <laughs> that kind of a thing, which they do alone in bed at night. All this is taken into account. Now, a third medicine is Pulsatilla. P-U-L-S-A-T-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. These people are also hot-natured, meaning they don't like the heat, can't stand a stuffy room or car. But these people love consolation. They want somebody to make over them, to be sweet to them, to hold them, etc. So now we have three different medicines which we distinguish in this fashion. So it goes on and on. It's quite it's quite intricate and requires a bit of study in order to do it well. So I am gathering that brings into mind a question and I I would just love to hear this answer. So um I have listeners, and my, I've got some pretty sophisticated listeners, and I think homeopathy is something they themselves move to because they do not like drugs. And uh, from that from that viewpoint, we're all of like mind in this here at uh, the radio show and in our listenership. But it appears to me there's a level of savvy and sophistication within the command of the of the homeopathists themselves to be able to pull large numbers of symptoms and make some sense out of them and tie them to these remedies. This isn't, I've um, got a cold, or maybe the acute in the acute cases, can you get a remedy just for it? But when the chronic diseases come, this makes the, the level of sophistication really mandatory when it comes to homeopathy and who's determining the remedy. Am I picking up on something here? Uh, well, let's let's talk about an acute situation because we just I just mentioned um, migraines, which are chronic. But in an acute thing, let's say a fever, a child has a fever or an adult, but let's say it's a child. And uh, now, in regular medicine, you know, a fever is treated with uh, some sort of a antipyretic to bring the fever down, and maybe a, something for pain if there's pain. But with homeopathy, let me give you the following example. We find out that the fever came on suddenly, meaning within minutes. We find out also that it comes on every day at 3 p.m. Now, what does that have to do with it? Well, you'll see in a second. 
With the fever, the child's face becomes extremely red, or not extremely, but red, and quite hot. Hot so that when you ask the mother, if you hold your hand about six, eight, ten inches above your child's face, can you feel the heat radiating? And she says, yes, it's that hot. And then I say, say it's on the phone. I say, well, now touch your child's hands and then the feet. She does. And I say, is, there a, is it the same heat? She says, no, they're quite cool. Aha. Uh -huh. Now we have a fever in which the blood is being pushed up into the head, head and neck. And then I say, well, look at this neck. Do you, can you see the, uh, the big blood vessels, which are called the carotids? Are they, are they visible? And she says, yeah. So they're throbbing. So we have the force of the illness now is pushed up into the neck and head, causing this throbbing. And if the child's old enough, they can say there's a pulsating headache, for example, along with the fever. So when we have uh, this fever with heat in the head and face and coolness in the hands and feet and a throbbing sensation, it's probably going to be belladonna. And belladonna will often bring that fever down, sometimes within 10 to 30 minutes, to just bring it down, you know, four or five, six points right down to normal mm. from, say, 104. And uh, by the next morning, they're well. Now, the interesting thing is that the belladonna with this pattern, again, is heat in the head and face with redness plus coolness in the extremities, hands and feet. When you see this, it doesn't really much matter whether it's an ear infection or a headache or just a simple fever, or it could be a sore throat, a tonsillitis, could even be the beginning of, um, of uh, encephalitis, if those symptoms are present. So we're then not treating the illness as we do as conventional doctors, because I've just mentioned three, four different sure. named illnesses. We're treating a pattern that the body is displaying. And when the body displays this pattern, the homeopath knows immediately that the body is calling out for homeopathic belladonna. This, you get the idea? Uh, I am getting the idea. And it's fascinating that, uh, that you can take these varied symptoms and have a single remedy that because you've observed this, I heard from the beginning of this discussion, healthy people are given medicines, and I bet you they they get pretty hot, <laughs> and their throat hurts them, and all sorts of things, and then yeah. we get matched up somewhere on down the line when that yeah. thing is happening for real. So, yeah, yeah that... It gets, more, it gets more and more interesting, because um, especially in chronic disease, we find, and again... Nobody knows this unless you ask about it, but many chronic diseases affect one side of the body more than the other. So you've got to ask for it, and the patients may be even telling you. So, or they'll say, I have pain in the shoulders, and you say, well, which shoulder? They say, it's more in the right. Where did it begin? It began in the right, and then it moved to the left. Same for the hip, same for the knee. So everything's mostly right-sided, or it could be left-sided. It just happens that we also have medicines which pre predominantly affect mostly the right side and or mostly the left side. So we take that highly into consideration when we're prescribing. We wouldn't want a left-sided medicine for people with right-sided complaints and vice versa. See? You, see, you see what I'm talking about now? It just gets more interesting. The, the level of sophistication that ultimately is required by the real expert in homeopathy appears to be, um, that's the real, uh, what an art form that must really be, Doc. I mean, uh, well, to, to, yeah. these patterns, to take these patterns into account. What, it kind of it kind of bugs me a bit because these homeopathic medicines are readily available in health food stores. So you can go in and, and they come in little, either green or yellow or blue tubes with a one-word description on them. And so people pick them up and they use them any old how. Without, so it, for the general public, uh, 
homeopathy is kind of relegated to sort of a trivial therapy, where and indeed it's very sophisticated, as you pointed out, and uh, requires a lot of study in order to understand these medicines. But the FDA, in its wisdom or lack thereof, decided that everything had to be labeled, so you have one or two or three words on these tubes for a medicine which may have 2,000 symptoms in the proving. Is that not ironic? How ironic is that? Now, I know from reading your chapter in Top Docs, which, by the way, it was a wonderful time we had that in Phoenix, and I really enjoyed meeting you and spending a long time talking to you on many, many matters. And I look forward to doing it again, Doctor. Um, but uh, you have uh, you actually have a book on this subject, and I wanted you to give an opportunity to tell my listeners how to get it and how, how would that book help them. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just, just brought it out a month ago, and it's called Small Doses, Big Results, How Homeopathy Offers Help in Chronic Disease. Uh, it's mostly about chronic disease, but of course homeopathy also helps in uh, all kinds of acute illnesses. And I chose the title, Small Doses, because all these medicines are highly diluted and shaken. And um, big results is, of course, my idea of how you get uh, a strong curative response with these small doses. So I, I, I like my title. It's a catchy title. But it's a book designed for new people, and it's... it's book designed for patients, whether they're new patients or uh, old patients in homeopathy. And in the book, I explain all the theories about homeopathy and how it works, how the medicines are made, and on and on. And then I go into many, many, many uh, uh, clinical cases that I've, of sickness that I've treated successfully with homeopathy. And of course, I've selected many of my better cases, so they're very dramatic cures, and they're designed to show how extraordinary homeopathy can be when prescribed by an expert. And uh, this is another problem. There's not that many experts around, unfortunately. But um, in the book, for example, I, I uh, have a chapter on a young woman. She was 19 years old when she came to me, and she'd been kind of depressed. She hadn't been kind of depressed. She'd been very depressed since her whole life. And her mother was with her and said, yeah, she's never been, been, been right. She's been always been sluggish. And my impression of her was that she was not present. She was like a zombie. I mean, a zombie, literally, sort of. Uh, a zombie is a kind of creature that kind of moves, but and has a human resemblance, but isn't quite pre isn't at all present. I know that look. I know what you're talking about. I've seen it. Yeah. Anyway, um, she she had a, she didn't do well with antidepressants. Uh, she uh, she she had no ambition. She was indifferent. There was a kind of total apathy about herself, about her family, about life in general. And so this incredible indifference, now I began to think of a medicine called opium. Now opium, as you know, is a narcotic, but of course when prepared homeopathically, it contains no molecules of, of opium and it becomes quite a potent homeopathic medicine. And one of the things about homeopathic opium and regular opium is that it's an, anal it's an it's a narcotic so you don't feel pain. So I asked her about pain tolerance and found out that she had a very high level of pain tolerance. She could take a lot of pain without wincing, without, didn't, without even seem, seeming to notice it. Anyway, I uh, gave her a dose of homeopathic uh, opium and saw her uh, three weeks later, or three or four weeks later, and uh, the, the change was totally remarkable. She had, she was like a different person. She was alive and uh, talkative. She would found a job, and uh, she was like a new person. And then, then I was, I was fascinated, and I started asking about the mother. I said, "Can you tell me more?" And she said, "Well, yeah. When she was a little kid, she had, she had a bad pneumonia, and she." was no reaction. She didn't, she didn't even cry, nothing. So this same thing, there's no reaction from the beginning. And then I went back further. I said, well, what about the birth? She said, well, that was interesting. She said, I was 
racing to the hospital, and I was, I knew I was going to give birth very quickly. I got there, and my doctor wasn't there. He, was, he promised to be there. He was out somewhere. And the nurses wanted me to get on the examining table, and I said, no, I'm, I know I'm going to have this kid within 10 minutes. We've got to do it. And I was frightened to death. Well, this child was born to a mother who was in a state of high, high fear. It turns out that in the proving of opium that it produces great fear. So the ailment here was from fright. So now what happened? The mother, you know, she processed it. The, she gave birth. She got over the fright. But it was imprinted somehow onto the nervous system of this child. So she was born into what I call, or we homeopaths would call, an opium state. She was indifferent to the point of extreme apathy and, uh, well, everything I've just said. So it was an extraordinary uh, thing, and that's one chapter in the book. So there's many, many other interesting cases. That is a fascinating story. Went back since birth 19 years ago by. You catch pieces of this, see a pattern, come up with opium, and voila, she's like, she's a fully functioning person. She's got a job, and she's got a new outlook on life. My goodness, doctor, you, you are quite the expert. She, she came in a couple of years later. Uh, she gotten married in the meantime, had a child. She came in for a child. She was a different person. So, yeah. That is, that is just unbelievable. I, the problem, the problem with homeopathy is it's very difficult. Not all cases are clear. It's not, they're not all clear cut. And of course, every doctor who's honest with himself knows that nobody cures everybody. I mean, if you're a doctor, it's a, we're working in what I call a fail sure atmosphere, meaning we always fail in the end. Everybody dies in the end. So we're doing our best in the meantime. But, Homeopathy is difficult because, as I've said, it's hard to see these patterns sometimes. The more experience you have, the easier it gets, but it's still it's still tricky. Well, one more time, Doctor, the book, I'm going to get a copy of it, I can tell you that. Tell our listeners and myself as I jot down where and how do we get a copy of your new book. Uh, well, you can get it from me directly, and, of course, it's on Amazon. Dot com. I think we're selling it on Amazon for 19.95, and um, I can sell it cheaper if you buy in quantity from my office. So uh, my my office, you want my phone number or what? Oh, give my listeners they'll, they'll call you, Doc. Uh, give my listeners the best way to get this book, and I guarantee you they'll do it. Okay. Um, Phone number is 713-621-3184, and uh, the website is www.homeopathyyes.com. Homeopathy is H-O-M-E-O-P-A-T-H-Y-Y-E-S.com, and uh, there's a lot of interesting cases on that website, too, many of which are in the book but uh, many of which are not. So that's two ways to get the book. Uh, through Amazon, it's, it's quick. Uh, through my office, it'll be a little slower, maybe, because I'll have to get it and mail it out. But And the title yeah. again, Doctor, Small Doses, Big Results. I got that right? That's it. Small Doses, Big Results. That's a definite read for me, and I hope my listeners pick up on this fascinating discussion of this pattern component. I've never heard... A pattern element brought into a discussion before and it appears like it's bedrock it's like the cornerstone you got to have these patterns and you don't do this on a one-on-one -on -one, um, one-to-one symptom uh, and I never really had that pointed out to me that way thank you very much for that doctor um, I, I know I had talked to you about uh, coming aboard and discussing one of the presentations you made to us at Top Docs was your discussion concerning aluminum. And um, no. could you take some time to talk to us about aluminum in terms of how prevalent a toxic substance it is, where we get this doggone stuff, how we get rid of it? Um, and, and by the way, is, is that a remedy, a homeopathic remedy to get rid of it too? And if there is, kindly inform yeah. us on what that would be. Sure. Well, 
Um, here's here's kind of the background of the story. We do have aluminum. It's aluminum oxide, and we call it alumina. A L U M I N A. Alumina is aluminum oxide, and aluminum oxide is probably the most common form of aluminum that people ingest or get on under their skin. So, but alumina as a homeopathic medicine is is known as a rare, rarely prescribed medicine until for me recently. So my wife uh, uh, had extreme allergies, and uh, she had ex recurrent sinusitis, which was resistant to homeopathy. Uh, she needed strong antibiotics plus steroids to get over it, and that occurred three times a year. She had asthma. She was on inhalers. She was allergic to a number of foods and, uh, and air, uh, pollens of all sorts. I treated her without success for years, and I had some of the better some of the best, actually, homeopaths in the world treat her also without success. And then one day, I was at a at a meeting, a homeopathic meeting, and the presenter was talking about a case of Illumina, uh, the medicine. And she mentioned, of course, you know that there is a lot of aluminum in black tea. Well, I didn't know that. So I looked it up. And... Uh, I found out that yes, indeed, black tea plant extracts aluminum from the soil, so it goes into the leaves. And when you when you drink black tea and add lemon or lime, the rate of absorption of the aluminum goes up sixfold. That's thousand six hundred percent. So what happened with my wife was when she came to me before we were married as a patient. I told her to stop drinking coffee because in those days I believed that coffee antidoted uh, homeopathy. I don't believe that now. But so I, she went on tea and she would steep the tea for 20 minutes and uh, then add lemon and she would do this, have three cups a day. Plus she was had been a lifelong user, a user of uh, a deodorant or antiperspirant that contained uh, aluminum and she went to the beach often when she could and Lathered itself with these uh, sunblocks, which this SPF stuff, which contains quite a lot of aluminum. So immediately we stopped stopped her tea uh, and um, stopped the uh, deodorants and put her on homeopathic alumina. And uh, she had been irrigating with the help of an ENT guy here in Houston, and it it was helping her a bit, but. Was still getting sick and still needing these antibiotics and these inhalers and all that. So immediately she she went on the Illumina. Her irrigation yielded all I can say is crud. It was quite unbelievable. More than mucus, there was like old blood and uh, even old tissue came out. She was like mm. constantly amazed. Uh, it was disgusting stuff that came out, but. And, and she was doing it twice a day, and every time she would remark, this is just unbelievable what's coming out, various colors, everything. At any rate, she started to feel better. So we started cutting down on her medicines, and within one month, she was off all three inhalers, and she's never had asthma since. And this is a year and a half, more than a year and a half ago, and uh, she's never had another case of sinusitis requiring a... Uh, uh, antibiotics. So she's still allergic, and she still has very little sense of smell or taste. So she's not cured completely, but extremely improved. So that was the first big thing for me. And then after that, I started looking into it, and I found out that um, see the problem with aluminum is that people are smearing it into the into the skin with these deodorants. And many people are doing it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, their whole lives. And it does find its way through the lymph. It does find its way into the brain. Now, what does it do in the brain? Well, when you do autopsies on people with Alzheimer's disease, they have up to four times the amount of aluminum that a, a person who doesn't have Alzheimer's brain has. 
So there's a strong connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's, although the current research researchers have minimized this and don't want to go into it. Why, I do not know. They're all into the genetic component of mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. So I'm not saying there isn't a genetic component. Clearly there is, but we're seeing this enormous increase in Alzheimer's. Well, before you get to Alzheimer's, what happens? You start to lose finer memory. So what I find in people who need homeopathic alumina, what I find are two things. One is that they're, well, more than two things. First of all, they've been using aluminum uh, in sunblock and in antiperspirants and deodorants for years. And the other thing is their memories are off. They, they wander into a room, wonder why they're there. And then their balance becomes affected, which is the cerebellum. So they're, you say, well, do you ever bump into things? Yeah, I bump into furniture all the time and into walls. And what about... Um, what about dropping things? Yeah, I drop things. I don't want to drop. So we have the memory, the balance, and the history of chronic aluminum intake through the skin. With those three big features, you can give homeopathic alumina, and uh, people start to get better, sometimes dramatically. I have some cases I can share if you're interested. Well, that's uh, one of those cases where there's a pattern again, that doggone pattern. It's just makes you got to go thinking alumina with the kind of pattern you just described. It's almost a, a tit for tat. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. I'm not saying that because we're, we're now, the culture, everybody's exposed to aluminum, which is only a hundred-year-old phenomenon. Before, in, before the 20th century, nobody was. Uh, even though aluminum is the number one metal in the Earth's crust and the third most common element after oxygen and silica, it's the number one metal, but it was always bound. It's always been bound up uh, in various uh, compounds in the Earth's crust. And was, then it was in the end of the 19th century. It started getting mined, and by the World War One, it was finding its way into the first antiperspirant. So we've had a century now of aluminum use. And I'm not saying that everybody who uses aluminum in the form of uh, deodorants needs homeopathic aluminum, most of them just need to stop using it before they get symptoms. But if you have a history of use, heavy use, plus memory problems, plus balance problems, then you probably need homeopathic aluminum. And I've taken people who had literally undiagnosed uh, syndromes and brought them back to a normal state using homeopathic aluminum. It's been quite astounding to me. Amazing. Uh, great, great work. Um, we're we're moving toward the end here of our time. Um, with respect to aluminum, um, do you know? The, I mean, the, the way that the other alternative community deals with this is trying to get rid of heavy metals, heavy metal testing, uh, chelating agents, and um, I think that it's pretty much universal. Very difficult to pull off aluminum in that way, and so you may just have exposed how it is done better, I think is what you're trying to say, is it's done better through using yeah. homeopathic means. Well, it, 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 we don't know. I think you're right. It's harder. It's maybe harder to chelate um, aluminum. I don't, I'm not an expert in, in chelation. Now, my, the problem with my cases is I didn't measure the aluminum either in the hair or in the blood or in the urine, so I don't know if they had high levels of aluminum. All I know that was what I told you. They had a use of aluminum and they had memory and balance problems. So what we need to do is start measuring people's heavy metals to see, in addition to the common ones, which are lead and mercury and arsenic, to see if they also have aluminum. And then to treat with homeopathic alumina and see if they, the levels come down. So that that's something that needs to be done. One quick final, it's sort of out, of out of kilter, but I can tell you I frequently get asked questions uh, by patients who are about to have or who have had radiographic procedures, whether that's CT scanning and the like, and uh, they're very much concerned ahead of time or even afterwards what they can do about it. And I'm on the mindset that there are homeopathic remedies that can be used prophylactically and post-exposure also. Could you give my listeners some idea of if, if, in fact, something like that is available and what it would be? Radiation? Yes. Radiation.
Uh, yeah, there is. Um, well, there's a time-honored one, which is, uh, again, it's not proved, and I learned this from an old woman, kind of. And that says you, you take a salt and soda bath, a cup of salt and a cup of soda, and stay in it for 20 minutes, and that seems to help. And it's safe, so that won't harm anyone. That That's one way to deal with it. Most of the time, I don't think people have uh, have symptoms. There's also homeopathic medicines. We have homeopathic radium bromide. Uh, we There's also homeopathic granite. And uh, so... But usually you need symptoms before you want to prescribe them. Is that pretty much a standard rule? You got you should be having the expression of symptoms before you utilize home. You don't use homeopathics prophylactically. Am I, is that the message I get? Uh, yeah, kind of. It's possible. Well, that's a very good question. When we when I'm treating somebody what we call constitutionally, mind, emotions, and uh, body, and get the right medicine. It not only helps their current illness, but it helps them from getting ill in the future, for, in, in general against everything. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So so what, what we think is happening with correct homeopathic prescribing is that we may be even turning on and turning off certain genes so that the body goes into a state of well-being and normalcy in which the body begins to cure itself. Uh, at any rate, homeopathic medicines, we don't know whether what I just said is, is true, but some sort of state of balance ensues in which the body is able to deal with all kinds of uh, viruses, bacteria, heavy metals, and on and on, and, uh, and do okay. So there you got it. I sure did get it. Um, I've been fascinated by this discussion with you. I'm going to encourage my listeners to get that book. Uh, once again, uh, small doses, big results. The author, Carl Robinson. Uh, I'll be giving that number out uh, pretty frequently, doctor. Hope to be able to talk to you in the near future, too. We're now at the end of our hour. Thank you so much for coming aboard this morning. First of the top docs. And Folks, I guess you can understand why he is a top doc. So uh, thank you so much. This is Dr. Dennis Courtney now saying so long for Aim Impact on Your Health. Are you there, Carl? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for the show, buddy. Great job on that homeopathy. You're a great interviewer. You, 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 you have a lot of enthusiasm. You, you help me. Oh hey, uh, didn't I just had pride a little bit? But you you revealed some things never had, that have never come across in any discussion with on homeopathy, and they they've just rocked my world. And as usual, Carl, you you now provoked me to go do some more reading, buddy, because uh, I'm a I'm a neophyte when it comes to what you just described. Yeah, well, I'm a neophyte in, in all the nutrition you know. <laughs> in the future, tell them that my name.